Well, greetings from uh, the Asia Society. I'm Kevin Rudd. I'm president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, normally in New York, except I'm currently in exile in Australia for COVID-19 reasons. Um, uh, right now in the Asia Society Policy Institute, we're running a series called the COVID New Abnormal. Uh, and that's because of the impact on all of our lives. And frankly, uh, all countries around the world as we adjust our economies, we adjust our political arrangements, and in fact, we adjust our social discourse with each other to cope with um, uh, this challenge of our time, COVID-19. But I'm delighted to be joined um, by uh, Andreas Dracopoulos, co-president of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, or SNF for short, which has uh, been around for a quarter of a century. Uh, it's had a remarkable impact around the world, some 4,700 grants, and its core areas of interest are in uh, areas of uh, health, uh, in areas uh, which uh, assist uh, in um, education and assist in the functioning of our general economies and societies. And so I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Andreas today with a view to discussing uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the functioning of our democracies here in the 21st century. Um, let me begin by um, noting the fact that uh, if your name is Andreas Trakopoulos, you've probably got some Greek ancestry. Uh, and if you're co-president of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, um, it's probably got a big Greek connection as well. Uh, and in preparation for our discussion with uh, Andreas today, I've done a little bit of reading into how plague has been treated uh, in uh, ancient times. Um, uh, Homer writes extensively about plague uh, impacting uh, as a curse of the gods uh, in the attempts by the Greeks to take Troy and, of course, uh, to retrieve Helen of Troy. And then uh, a couple hundred years later, uh, we have Thucydides and Sophocles writing extensively about the impact of plague um, on, uh, on Athens. And uh, in Thucydides' treatment uh, of uh, the uh, funeral oration of Pericles, it, follows a, it is followed by a very long description of the impact and the demoralizing effect of the plague on the citizens of Athens. In fact, it was plague that ultimately killed Pericles, although Thucydides himself survived. And so uh, what we see in those ancient writings is the physical impact and the psychological impact of dealing with plague which overwhelmed the doctors of the ancient world. Enough about ancient history. Uh, let's roll the clock on two and a half thousand years um, to um, how it's this crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, is uh, impacting on both democracies and authoritarian societies around the world. Um, so um, welcome, uh, Andreas. Great to have you with us. Could you begin by describing us how you have seen the Greek democracy, the modern Greek democracy, uh, handle uh, the COVID-19 crisis and any lessons you think lie in that for the rest of us. Andreas. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's interesting, you said the, that the plague in the ancient times had a lot of demoralizing effect uh, on the people. And I think, uh, as you were saying that, I said, so what has changed? Mm. Uh, because we're still seeing, I think, it's an interesting, I was thinking about it, it's a, this is a pandemic, uh, but in its true sense, it's a global pandemic. Even, uh, uh, you know, during times of war, there were always places that you could, if you could, of course, that you could go to, uh, to find a safe place. And I think it's the first time, which nobody has really uh, talked about it, it's the first time that this is a really global pandemic and you cannot hide. You cannot run and hide. You cannot go anywhere. Yes, there's some places that go through, a, you know, a soft cycle, a hard cycle, but it's a pandemic that has really uh, affected the whole world. And in many ways, it has demoralized, I think, the whole world. In many ways, it has exposed, in my view, a lot of the weaknesses that existed in society before. And this was the 
it was not the cause for all the problems that we're having today. I think it was the, the excuse that all these problems got exposed. We can talk later if you want about, you know, social injustice and all the, mm. all the issues about the lack of social justice that have come up. Uh, the reason for that is not COVID. Mm. COVID was another excuse that these issues came uh, up to the surface. Uh, talking about, uh, so there, there are so many things that one, that one can talk about and sometimes it seems that you go left and right and one talks about this and that, but in a very strange way, they all come around and they all somehow interconnect, which I find fascinating. Uh, so what about Greece? So I'm a, I was born in Greece. I was raised in Greece until I came to college in the U.S. And then since then, uh, I've lived in the U.S., in, in New York. So, um, and then I go back quite often with my kids during the summer. And I managed to do that this, this summer too. And it was an amazing uh, experience because I was here in New York, uh, self-quarantining in our, in our home uh, for the whole spring. And then in, uh, in, in June, uh, I went to Greece uh, for most of the summer. And I have to say, when I arrived in Greece, I felt, I felt, my God, I'm free. Mm. Now, a, a lot of it has to do, uh, because I grew up there and I have friends and I have family, but it, it's amazing and I'm, I'm sensing it as, a, as I've come back to New York. Uh, the way that the whole thing is being handled and I'm, I don't want to judge because I don't know. And I, and I think nobody knows, but it's interesting how the cultural effect on top of everything else, because we all know, and it doesn't matter what you believe, I think in, your, in our own political views, it's an issue which has been completely politicized in so many ways. And actually I think it's a real shame because uh, by being so, so politicized, thus polarized, uh, we don't know where we are, and I think we feel uh, we feel lost. Having said that, again, in Greece, maybe it's it's because the culture is, is such. Uh, it was much much calmer. So yes, you wear masks, uh, especially now because there's some more, more COVID cases. When I left, uh, you wear masks, but life in a way goes on. Hmm. Now you may say that is being that you're not being careful. Then you come back here in New York, I think it's, it's so strict, you know, you might as well stay in your home because there's not much to do anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about it many times, what's the right way to do it? And I don't know for sure what is the right. I know, I know they're different. Uh, I know Greece was, in my view, lucky more than good uh, in, in the sense that in the first wave back in the spring, uh, they closed down fast. So that was a political de decision, and I think credit goes to the government, but credit goes also more to the people, uh, that they were, they, were very, they were very disciplined, they stayed home, and I think the first, the, the first wave, uh, Greece did, I think, among the best in the whole world. The problem was that uh, maybe they became a bit arrogant, they thought they had, they had beaten COVID. Uh, Greece, as you probably know, depends, I mean, has gone through a very tough uh, decade through the socioeconomic crisis be before it was starting to recover. Tourism is, uh, is one of the most important areas that uh, Greece depends on for its survival, basically. So uh, they took the risk and they, op they opened up the country. For some tourism, of, of course, not too many people came, but some people came. And as some people came, and there was this confusion about, the, you know, are you tested, are you not? Some tests at the airport. Make a long story short, COVID started reappearing again. Uh, and I think uh, everybody was a bit shocked and said, but ho hold on, we went through the first wave, we did so well, which by the way, but that's another story, I think has to do a bit with the genetic uh, disposition of Greeks because it has to do about tuberculosis and about T TB that uh, in Greece after the war many people had TB and then everybody, still now uh, you get the vaccination for TB 
And there's a theory that the, the vaccination for TB helps a bit on the, makes you more immune to the COVID. So there, there, was, there was some, some luck involved, some genetics involved, some whatever. So they, they, they did well and they're still doing well in absolute terms. I mean, we're talking about 300, 400 cases a day. Although, again, there's so many things to talk about. Although you never know who gets tested, how many get tested, when do they get tested? So for me, the common denominator is that there are so many unknowns, basically because medically itself, I don't think even the scientists know enough. Then you have the issue of the whole COVID having been politicized, which is a shame. Then you have the combination of the two causing a lot of people to lose trust to lose trust uh, on local leaders, on political leaders, on uh, medical leaders. Uh, and I think that's, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get through it, uh, whether it's through, uh, through medicine, through a vaccine, we'll get through it. It's a matter of time, I think. The thing is, uh, what stays with us, what, uh, what, what damage we have to go through, uh, the most important, of course, being the loss of of lives, which is huge, which is another issue. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I keep going a bit left and right, but I think there's so many things which are so important. And uh, including when we talk about the loss of lives, what I find fascinating and very depressing actually is that it, in my view, you know, you talk about collateral damage when you have one year during a war. Collateral damage becomes part of being at war. And I think that became almost <clears throat> acceptable uh, during uh, times of this, of this pandemic, and still is. Uh, but, well, we lost only X or we lost only you know, so many or whatever, as if it's okay to lose lives. Which, again, I'm, I'm trying to look once we go on the other side and we get out of it, what stays. And I think what, what stays is, again, that... <sighs> Have we learned anything? In other words, let's say we get out of it in a few months. It's a matter of time. We're going to be hit again. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, hopefully in a long time. But have we really learned anything? At least I'm, I'm not seeing any real uh, uh, signs that we have as a society learned. I'm afraid we're going to go back to, which is human. We all need that. We, we, we have all been demoralized. We're going to go back to trying to live the lives we used to live. And I think if, even though people say, well, life will never be the same, I would bet you the vaccine comes out tomorrow, within a few weeks, we're all going to go like crazy back to the lives we all knew because that's who we are. But have we really learned anything? When you hear about hospitals not having enough PPE, it's actually, that in itself is demoralizing. So nobody was ready for it. And what I'm afraid is we should spend time after we get out of it. Uh, those who have the responsibility have the, you know, are, are in the position to do so, to talk about under more normal circumstances, what do we do to make sure we're better prepared the next time? Hmm. And, and I think we would really have all of us from whatever we do to make sure that these discussions do take place. Because... Uh, uh, again, it's been a mess. It's been a mess, whichever way you look at it. It's been a mess. And yes, it was. A, it's a black swan. It was a global pandemic. We didn't know anything. We didn't know much about it. We still don't know much about it. Uh, so we are adjusting. But I think a lot of it has to be done in terms of once we get out of it, what did we learn and how do we prepare better for the next time? Because I, I worry about that. And... I really worry about the, this has been like the, you know, the last thing to, to hit us about lack of trust. And we are losing trust, not only in, in our leaders, but in global institutions. And that is, for me, it's, it's worrisome for democracy itself. Uh, you, can, you can be critical of the democracy in this country or in that country, but overall, I think we all agree democracy is the best form of, of, of government. Uh, but I worry about this lack of trust and the long-term uh, negative effect it can have into our societies. 
and to you know in our political parties, etc. So I know I've been I've, I've gone to many places, but just wanted to share a few <laughs> thoughts that come to my mind. The reason, the reason um, Andreas, you've gone to many places is because COVID nineteen affects all places. Uh, not just in its geography, which, as you said, uh, for the first time uh, is a genuinely global pandemic and in a way in which the Spanish flu was not nearly as global uh, straight after the First World War. But also it affects um, every aspect uh, of people's lives, uh, their social uh, life, um, their economic life and their political life. A couple of um, themes I'd like to explore with you further. One, one you've touched on, which is the politicization of the pandemic, of which um, in the United States, uh, the wearing of masks has often been the, um, the biggest uh, external symbol of that politicization. If you wear a mask, you're seen as being a, a, a centrist, center-left uh, voting <laughs> Democrat. Um, and if you don't wear a, a, a mask, you're a freedom, freedom-loving, almost libertarian Republican, um, and that uh, this, uh, for those of us who are not Americans, and I'm not, this um, uh, attitude to uh, the simple wearing of masks as a public health device, I find extraordinary. So, and this goes to the question of the fracturing of our democracies. So over the course of the last six months, Andreas, you've been both in Greece and you're back in uh, the United States in New York. Can you give me some reflections about um, where this mask wearing issue uh, has, uh, has gone and the different approaches on the part of those of us with, let's call it uh, what we describe as a more conventional public health culture and those uh, who have seen it as a defining and dividing line in our nation's politics. Your thoughts on that, my friend? Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, issue, and I think we described it very well, and as you were describing it, I was saying, what a shame, what a shame for all of us that it has gotten to that, that the pure uh, fact of, like, you wear a mask because no matter what, it's better than not to, to say the least. <laughs> Uh, it can help others and it can help you. So we shouldn't even be talking ab about it. We should be just doing it. But the fact that it became politicized from the beginning, I think that's that's the really worrisome uh, issue. Hmm. In in the U.S., it, it, I mean, the way that I see it, uh, in, in, in the U.S., you described it exactly as it is. And again, I think it, it doesn't help that maybe at the beginning, even the, I think it was, the World Health Organization that was saying you shouldn't be wearing masks. It doesn't really help. Uh, and then they changed and said, well, you should be wearing. So that in itself also, at least at the beginning, was a bit confusing to say the least. Hmm. Uh, and then, but then it became fully, fully politicized. It's interesting because in, in Greece, it's not politicized. On the other hand, it was more of a cultural thing. In other words, you know, in Greece, sometimes people say, you know, we don't want, we, we don't like to follow rules too much. We want to, you know, live life and this and that. So that was more about a cultural way of saying, you know what, uh, I'll be socially distanced, but do I have to wear the mask? But it was never a political statement. It was more of a cultural statement. Uh, I believe it's it's common sense. We don't know enough, uh, even if it's not. The best thing to do, it helps to wear a mask more than it hurts to wear a mask. So we should all wear masks. <laughs> uh, and it, it seems, uh, Andreas, to touch on the second question, which is the trust in our democracy, our trust in our democratic institutions. Because in those countries where the institutions seem to be more trusted, when the formal public advisory has gone out, wear a mask. Why do large people have done that? Um, and, uh, and of course, including in non-democracies like China, where the order has gone out, you sh thou shalt wear a mask or else. Uh, it's quite plain. So, but in, let's call it the uh, democracies where there is trust, at least in the independence and integrity of the public health institutions, 
there's been a fairly high degree of compliance. Um, and despite the fact that uh, you'll have these cultural resistances, like in Greece, like in my own country, Australia, uh, Australia, where people generally don't like wearing masks, but if the medicos say you've got to wear a mask, uh, then, for example, in the city of Melbourne, where there has been a second wave outbreak, and people wear masks. Um, so, uh, and the flip side of this is in the United States, where you've seen a movement evolve really over the last 40 years in the American democracy, uh, dare I say it, since the Reagan revolution, which is this rolling campaign against government, um, that its cumulative effect has been the delegitimization of government in the eyes of, let's call it, so many centre and centre-right voting Americans, so that, uh, therefore, when the public health authorities come out and say, you should do X, Y and Z, including wear a mask, we've got to that stage in America, with a country you love and a country which I love, where uh, people saying, well, can we trust that? because uh, there must be an underlying conspiracy associated with that. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that observation in terms of trust and mask wearing. I think it's a, it's a rather depressing observation, but a very, a very true observation. And it's, uh, again, it's actually sad, but it, it is happening. And I think it's more like a, the result of what you were talking about, that it, it can be expressed uh, the, the fact that you can express your dissatisfaction by not wearing a mask is sad in its own uh, way. Mm. Uh, as as a society, as a human society, as a democracy, and and not only. So it's a very sad uh, situation. But again, I think it's a much deeper problem, and uh, we have to really focus on it. Uh, it's not just the mask. The mask is just comes like you know at the top of the thing. I mean, there's there are deeper issues, uh, and again, the whole polarization that has taken place in the last few years uh, has become toxic, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and we have to deal with it one way or the other as a society. I'm a big believer that, and again, it sounds philosophical, but. We have to work together. I mean, uh, it, not only from the right and the left, which I, I don't think, in my view, it shouldn't exist even. What does it mean right and left? I mean, the society is so complex today, so complicated. It's about doing the right thing. It's about working, work, working together if we want to remain a democratic and free and free society. And in terms of the state and the private sector, I think it, they've been a bit antagonistic. I laugh because I say, I mean, I believe in capitalism, but I think the the issues of social justice we have to do much better, and uh, and I think that the private sector and the and the and the governments have to work much better together. And I think the problems that are around us are so complex, are so big, that if we don't work together, uh, nobody is going to win. And even if you you know the governments have had problems throughout, but it's not that the private sector on its own can do miracles. I mean, look back, I mean, I, uh, you know, and I believe in the private sector within the context of flexibility within a structure. And I think you need the structure imposed by the government and you, you need the governments to be flexible to let the private sector work within the structure. You need to find the, the, right, the right balance. And how can you talk about, you know, we don't need governments when in 08, in the US, the financial crisis, if it wasn't for the Fed, if it wasn't for the government, there would be no private sector left. If you look now, if, if you look now with the health thing, if it wasn't for the government and the state, I mean, there wouldn't be any. I mean, we would be, you know. So I, I, I think we shouldn't even be talking about whether it should be more government or more private. For me, and COVID is, a, is another wake-up call. How many wake-up calls are we going to get? That we, we have to work together. And people talk about the COVID as being, you know, of, of course it's a, it's a very bad thing, but it could, it could be worse. And, and it is going to get worse. So that's why I, I, I brought up before the fact that when we get out of it, will we have the, the brains to sit together and talk about how do we prepare better for the next time? What do we learn? Not about uh, accusing one another, because of course many mistakes were made. 
we, we were not prepared and nobody could really be prepared for such a really global pandemic. In a way, we have been like, uh, it wasn't a much, you know, uh, worse pandemic. I think um, you uh, raise, I think, a fundamental issue in the debates uh, about, uh, let's call it the new COVID abnormal. Uh, and one of which is what will be the enduring lessons learned. And underneath that, um, how many times are we going to be given the opportunity to uh, undertake lessons learned as uh, nature throws up one systemic crisis after another, uh, which tests our institutions uh, to the core. I'm not going to take the conversation in the direction of climate change, that's for another day, but it's also a question of, as it were, science versus politics of, uh, let's call it, uh, the proper agency of the state setting a framework within which private citizens and private corporations operate. And so too with global pandemics, and so too with the global financial crisis, you just mentioned the events of 089. And I certainly remember as a uh, social democrat, as prime minister of Australia, having one leading capitalist after another walk into my door and, and ask to be protected from the impacts of this massive uh, collapse of markets. So surely that was a lesson in itself as well. So where you've got to in the conversation, Andreas, is this uh, classic uh, conflict which continues to emerge and re-emerge even in 21st century democracy between, uh, let's call it, uh, free markets uh, and what we would call social democracy as if these concepts are somehow polar opposites exactly. and ultimately irreconcilable. Whereas I suppose my take would be for democracy, which sits above both these philosophical traditions, that is liberal capitalism in one direction and social democracy in another, for democracy to survive and within it liberal capitalism to survive, it must have a social democratic structure. Otherwise, uh, Firstly, you're constantly going to return to the ideological binary nature of the debate. You can't do this because it's socialist and you can't do that because it's a capitulation to the market, which is just nonsense from the point of view of your average citizen. Instead of secondly, understanding that the function of social democracy, and it's been this way, I think, for more than 100 years, uh, at its best has been to civilise global capitalism. Um, and that is to remind global capitalism, um, as in the days of Adam Smith, that it's the continuing provision of these public goods, of public health care, of public education, and of a state strong enough and powerful enough to intervene in the economy and finance in order to maintain macroeconomic stability, that in fact the future of our entire democratic project itself rests on our ability to bring together these two philosophical traditions and to achieve that marriage for the long term. So I think what you're talking about, my friend, is so close to the core lessons learned for the future. I don't know if you've got further reflections on that one. No, but I think you said it absolutely uh, perfect. And I think it's, it's, I wouldn't even, you know, people sometimes use uh, adjectives, you know, whether as you did about social democracy or liberal democracy. And I tell people, talk about democracy. Talk about democracy in the old sense of, you know, freedom. Of, uh, but you need decency. You need, you need to do things right and you need to work together. And again, I, I keep going back to it because I think it's so common sense. The problems that we are facing today, whether it's climate, whether it's uh, uh, inequalities in every aspect, whether it's uh, technology coming into our lives and without even uh, noticing it, it's going to take us over. And it's, you know, many people can say it has already happened. Uh, if, you, if you have young kids, as I do, uh, it's basically taken over their lives. So there's so many issues that we should be really talking about. And I'm, I'm saying that when I say we, I mean we the people. I mean we as a human society. And I don't even care whether, again, I really do not believe in, in my view, there's no left, there's no right. 
It's about, hey, guys, wake up. This is so much bigger than all of us. This is so much mm-hmm. bigger about this, about our kids. It's about, the, about, this, about us remaining human. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we could talk about AI and humanity at another time. Uh, it's something which our, our foundation is really uh, trying to spend a lot of time with, and we're having our, our conference again next year on it. There are so many issues that are really important, and they are happening, and we should be dealing with. Uh, instead of this old, you know, government mm-hmm. versus private, uh, socialist versus capitalist, I mean, let's move on. I mean, let's move on and try to work together. And you said that absolutely perfect. I mean, I, and I really believe in it. And we have to work together. And it sounds a bit like the old days in the 60s, you know, we have to work together, whatever, let's all sing. No, let's make sure that we don't sink, you know, if we mm-hmm. don't work together. So it's not a matter of choice. For, for me, it's a matter of survival. And, and I don't think, I think people, everyday people, have realized that and they have become in my view more more mature than the than the than the than all the politicians as a whole that continue to play politics we are in much deeper uh, territory and we need to work together yeah the great disconnect between politics and the people around the world today it strikes me as this elite level discourse um, which is uh, almost the tactics of the game, of the political game. And then beneath that, there is a much more basic discourse among the people, which yes. is yes. how do we survive? Yes. How do we prosper? And what is it to be, to use your term before, Andreas, uh, a human being in the 21st century, given the positive impact and at the same time the huge ravages of, uh, of globalization. I think you summed up quite nicely before. There's an old debate, which is uh, the one I paraphrased before, between liberal capitalism and social democracy. This is within the Western democracies. Um, And uh, it's almost become a stale debate because what the people want is a fusion of, in fact, the essential elements of both these traditions into a sustainable democracy. And that where they want to move on to is this much more profound question being driven by the new technologies, uh, most particularly uh, artificial intelligence and most particularly where the algorithms of the future are going to take us, which is what is it to be human and what is it to be a society in the 21st century, given those questions about the intrinsic dignity of human life uh, are now um, already before us because of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So, Andreas, uh, you run a large foundation. Um, You continue to uh, generously provide grants during this crisis. Now, what are the sort of projects which uh, have um, caught the attention of SNF over the course of the last uh, six to 12 months? Where are you investing? And uh, and, uh, what results are you beginning to see uh, in those uh, philanthropic investments uh, around the world? Yeah, what I would say is that we haven't basically changed since we were, quote, unquote, born. Thanks to my late great uncle, Stavros Nyakos, who left us the economic means by which to start the foundation and do all this, all this good work. We don't have any, any policy agenda, so we have these four areas, as you mentioned a few of them at the beginning, arts and culture, education, health and sports, and social welfare, and under which we are very, you know, we do a lot of things, a lot of different things. We've been to about 100 25 countries, I think, in the world. Uh, and what we say always is, if if an idea comes to us, and we're open for business 7, 7 24, 365, we receive uh, grant requests. And, and from the smallest, the biggest, whatever. What we say is, if we see that something is going to have a positive impact and might make society better. It doesn't matter if it's that small or that big, but if, if, if it's going to have, if we feel it's going to have a positive impact. And if we realize that the people who are proposing it, people who are going to run it, are good people. When I say good people, I mean efficient, committed, and they're really going to do what they're saying they're going to do. Then our, our agenda is, how can we say no? So find a way for us, you know, uh, for our team, if we find what's wrong, otherwise we should do it. That's what we do. 
we try to help. We don't have an ATM, so we don't print money. But having said that, we have the ability to help. So we continue to help. Sometimes we do large initiatives. And I think when, when COVID hit, I think because we realized, and we are living through it now, that if this was a, a very complex uh, crisis, uh, had all of the elements, was a medical disaster, and then had a, a direct socioeconomic effect, uh, which we are living through it. Hopefully, some people say it's all going to be quickly, you know, quickly gone once we get a vaccine or or a therapy. Uh, so we established a new fund, a hundred million dollars global in- initiative. Uh, to try to to basically contribute uh, uh, to any related to any COVID related projects, and again, uh, we've spent we started in in April. We've uh, we have already contributed about seventy two million out of the hundred. One of the reasons is that I believe also that when people announce initiatives, I'm saying where's the beef? In other words, you know, you announce it, do it. So sometimes, mm-hmm. if somebody could be critical of us. And of me personally, that sometimes we we are too fast. But I'm I'm of, the, I'm of the opinion I'd rather make a mistake by being too fast and make sure that there's immediate impact because we can, than 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 sit sit back and you know and start analyzing and analyzing and and and, and trying to find the perfect project. Uh, so we're very proud that we have uh, already done you know 72, 73 percent. We've helped everywhere. I mean and in the U.S. continent, in Africa, in the Far East. Uh, we've done a lot in Greece, as we always do, because that's where we come from. And also because Greece had already gone through the 10 years of economic crisis. And we were in the midst of, we are building some new, some new hospitals. But uh, again, we have no policy agenda, which some people may say this is a weakness of ours. I see it as a as a huge advantage. We don't want to prove anything. We don't have anything to prove to ourselves either. Uh, just try to uh, help people who try to improve society. Well, I like your, uh, your contrast point, my friend, between uh, the perfect always being the enemy of the good, which is, uh, if in the philanthropic world, it's a bit like in public policy as a government. Yeah. You are permanently going to defer action in response to a challenge or an opportunity or a problem uh, as you wait for the, uh, the analyst to complete uh, the removal of all conceivable risk uh, from the project. Uh, then, as we'd say, quoting the great Australian poets, uh, nothing ever bloody well gets done. Um, because, I'm a big uh, believer of that. I'm a big believer of that. <laughs> But so, again, uh, we, we, we can be flexible because, again, I do believe that the two main pillars is the private mm-hmm. sector and the government's philanthropy can work as a small third leg. It shouldn't be anything more. It couldn't be anything more anyway. But having said that, it has, it has the flexibility and it should act fast and it should help where others, uh, where others can, can, cannot. Well, it's the nimbleness you've just spoken of. As we draw our conversation to a close, give me a sense of those projects you've backed over the years or now, uh, which give you the greatest sense of satisfaction in terms of the mission statement of, uh, of uh, SNF. Um, and uh, I'd be interested in that. It's an interesting question, and I think it's, it's something which we ask ourselves many times. I ask myself many times too. I still don't have the, the complete answer. But I think part of it is because I think our, our, our success has been that we don't really care about doing the one or two projects that will really define us. I want to believe that what defines us is the day-to-day work, is the day-to-day grants, whether it's a 10,000 grant or a million or a, or a 10 million grant. Uh, it's the process. It's, a, it's the satisfaction we get of helping others. Because again, it's thanks to our grantees that these things get done. We don't do them, we just help them. Uh, having said that, we have done a few uh, large projects. I mean, uh, our largest project is the Stavros Nyakos Foundation Cultural Se- Center in Greece, uh, which became the, the new home for the, for the public library 
and the and the opera house and and a very big park. Uh, we've done a, a big project with Rockefeller University in New York for the new campus. We we're just going to open the new uh, public library branch and, uh, on 41st and Madison, but COVID has has a bit delayed that. Uh, but again, we do, uh, you know, we, I mean, we get the same satisfaction from like small projects to big projects. Uh, what we try to have as a common denominator is the process from the time that uh, a request comes in, how is it going to help and how can we help them do the work? The, um, well, I'm sure Pericles, um, uh, a former resident of Athens, would be kind of pleased about that that uh, you now have a major uh, uh, art center, uh, which uh, you have constructed in the, in the capital of a mother of democracy. So um, I'm sure Pericles, despite his untidy end because of the plague in the fifth century BC, um, uh, as he sits with the Olympian gods at present, would have a, a smile on his face about uh, what uh, uh, Andreas and, uh, and SNF have been able to achieve. Very finally, my friend, you mentioned your flagship um, uh, conference, annual conference. I think you said it's coming up again soon. You, I presume you're doing it online or rather than the flesh. Um, well, what, do you, that, what do you hope to achieve? So that's an interesting. So we started this uh, annual conference back in the, at the beginning of the, of the crisis in Greece. We thought it was a, it was a, a, a one-off event. But we realized quickly that uh, not only in Greece, but in the whole of Europe, and might I say in most places outside the US where philanthropy is not really uh, an established industry, that there was a need for a, for, for a platform for people to get together to see how they can help. And because of that, we made it into an annual event. Uh, we actually added also a festival part of it. So it became a weekly event. Last year, we had to first, we actually canceled it back in March. And then in April, we said, let's do it vir virtually. Uh, so it's always uh, towards the end of, of June. And this year is going to be between the 23rd and 28th of June in Greece. And, and hopefully by then, we'll have a therapy or a vaccine. So we're actually preparing for it. Again, the main theme is, a, is humanity and AI. And there's a reason why we put humanity first. Humanity and AI, which was the theme for, for last year, and we did do a, a reduced virtual uh, uh, conference. Uh, but we are hoping and we are we're actually preparing for this year to do it physically at the, at the Cultural Center in Athens. But if not, of course, we're going to do it again uh, virtually. But we really hope, and I really think, I don't know if I hope or think more, that we're going to be able to do it. To be there well, uh, I, I'm with you, my friend, apart from the fact that Athens is a fantastic city. And, uh, and uh, let us hope that physically it's possible. And, uh, and, and we you will be joining us. <laughs> well, thank you for that. But, and, it's, and that it's not just our holograms that are meeting uh, one another uh, in, uh, in Athens. Uh, and that we're not just meeting online. But just to conclude, my friend, thank you for three things. Uh, one is uh, the generosity of your family because not every family does this. Um, and uh, it's really important. Um, two, thank you for being a voice for what I describe as the reasonable centre. Um, you know, what we discussed before between freedom and markets uh, and responsible, caring, humane government. And then um, thirdly, uh, for being fast and nimble um, uh, when uh, many of our foundations and certainly our governments uh, become encrusted with the barnacles of bureaucratic process um, and uh, you've chosen to do it differently. So Andreas Dracropoulos and the Stavros Niakos Foundation, thanks for your work and thank you for spending time with the Asia Society today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.